Hello, welcome to this wonderful panel. My name is Santiago, and you will get today six for the price of three. <laughs> because in the first place, you are going to listen, perform the guitarist of the rock and roll band, Sons of Bill. I know. You thought this was a good joke? Well, let me welcome him. This is James, our first speaker today, who he says two things. One, in his previous life, he was the guitarist of this very celebrated band. And two, if there are no questions afterwards, he might be open to play a song for us. But let's first listen to him speak about Augustine, post-critique, and the future of literary studies. I know, I know. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, uh, Santiago, for that uh, introduction. Um, it's so wonderful to be back here at Notre Dame. Um, uh, in, in my talk this afternoon, I, I want to take a, a step back uh, from the study of particular works of literature um, and take a bird's eye perspective on literary studies as a whole and uh, think about some of the larger intellectual problems that the discipline is currently facing. Um, the talk is animated by one of my overarching ambitions, which is to try and bring the secular and religious worlds into deeper conversation with one another. And so um, my talk today is not merely directed towards the study of literature at Catholic institutions, but the discipline more broadly. Um, I believe that our present moment is an opportunity for the Catholic tradition to not only uh, bring to bear its wisdom on contemporary problems, uh, but it can also perhaps help us reimagine uh, what a bright and hopeful future for the discipline might look like. And so while it's almost become cliche to speak of the crisis of the humanities, uh, it's clear that declining enrollments and methodological disputes uh, within the discipline are uh, calling scholars to reflect on fundamental questions regarding the significance in the future and importance of the discipline. Um, in particular, I want to focus on a growing movement uh, within the humanities, which is often referred to as post-critique. Uh, post-critique is an emergent discourse uh, championed by literary scholars such as Rita Felsky and Eve Sedgwick, um, who are challenging the various postmodern and post-structuralist approaches to literature which have dominated the field since the late 1960s. And in her landmark volume, The Limits of Critique, Felsky sets her sights on what she terms, following Paul Ricoeur, the hermeneutics of suspicion. And while Marxist, psychoanalytic, post-structuralist, feminist, and post-colonial approaches to literature may have different goals and methods, in and of themselves, uh, they are all animated by what Felsky uh, ar argues are guided by a pre-absolved suspicion of the text as it is presented on the surface. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay? I was in a band, sorry. <laughs> Just gotta check. Um, and as is well known, these various uh, suspicious approaches to literary criticism uh, emerge in the wake of uh, broader late modern philosophical suspicions regarding the early modern Enlightenment conceptions of the human person. While philosophers such as Descartes may have conceived of the human person as an autonomous rational subject, transparent to themselves, and capable of disinterested knowledge, the so-called masters of suspicion, Marx, Freud, and Nietzsche, all in different ways challenged this vision of personhood. In place of the autonomous subject, each of these thinkers envisioned human beings as driven by powerful, subterranean, irrational, and non-cognitive forces which persisted beneath the surface of conscious awareness. These thinkers observed that the inner life and drives of human beings are not only opaque to others, but we are also fundamentally opaque to ourselves. As Nietzsche famously phrased it, we do not know ourselves, we knowledgeable people. We are most ignorant to ourselves. And following this philosophical uh, legacy of suspicion, Felsky argues that literary critique since the 60s has largely been guided by an ambition to unmask the illusions of false consciousness, circumventing the self-evident meanings of a text to uncover the various normative assumptions power derives, 
psychoanalytic drives, and class dynamics which hide beneath the surface. And though Felsky was trained in critical theory and maintains its virtues, she argues that these deconstructive approaches are simply no longer attracting the uh, readership or yielding the promised liberation that they had promised in prior decades. Towards the end of The Limits of Critique, she argues that literary studies simply needs to move on, to let go of its unyielding commitment to suspicious reading and experiment with post-critical approaches. Um, as, uh, as according to Felsky, post-critical reading is not merely another theory or method in a traditional sense, but is rather simply a reorientation, a, a space to reconsider the significance guiding assumptions and conceptual frameworks which underwrite the discipline. To use Felsky's language, post-critique is a placeholder which allows the literary studies to take a moment to reconsider the foundational questions of why we read and why reading matters. And the chief aim of this paper is simply to explore what a post-critical approach to literary studies might actually look like in practice. For while Felsky's earnest appeal to move on from critique, critique may appear modest and relatively straightforward, the task of actually moving on has proven more intractable. As Tobias Skiverin recently observed, after 10 years of intense debate, post-critical discourse is still quite far from having a method as distinct and operationalizable, his word, not mine, as those developed under the banner of critique. Um, indeed, while post-critical uh, discourse has arguably been quite successful in diagnosing contemporary problems, they've been relatively thin on offering any stable visions for the future. And so why should this be the case? Um, I think there are several reasons why literary studies has been unable to move on from suspicious forms of reading. Uh, I believe this hesitancy can partially be attributed to the language that frames the discussion, particularly the uh, persistence of that infamously slippery prefix post. As we've learned from the last seven de decades of so-called post-modernity, I believe that any discourse that defines itself by what it's moving beyond runs the risk of never quite actually moving beyond it. it um, there's a perennial temptation within critical circles to develop what I call an intellectual Stockholm syndrome an unspoken commitment and even devotion to the very object of our criticism. Like Prometheus, these critical discourses can begin boldly rebellious, but leave us permanently bound, ironically the nourishing the beast that feeds upon us. When I've taught about uh, post-modernity in church context, I, I try to tell uh, the parishioners to imagine a, uh, a clever kid in the back of, of a classroom, probably wearing an Iron Maiden t-shirt like I did in high school, um, who's clever enough to drive the teacher from the classroom in tears but is not prepared to take over the class themselves. And uh, it's a situation which has left the contemporary humanities in what can feel like an interminable Beckett play. We're all sort of nervously waiting in a teacherless classroom, slowly coming to grips with the fact that not only is the teacher never coming back, but the bell is never going to ring. And, uh, but the second reason why I think it's proving so intractable is, is an unwillingness amongst uh, contemporary literary studies to face head on some of the deep conceptual incoherences and performative contradictions that many scholars have argued are baked into the very grammar of postmodern discourse. Particularly worthy of reflection is the relationship between these postmodern approaches and the so-called modern subject they claim to be moving beyond. For while critique may regard itself as a mode of reading that is liberated from the shackles of enlightenment-derived philosophical fallacies and self-deceptions, it's easy to overlook the extent to which these these critical approaches remain within the horizon of Enlightenment-derived concepts. For while critique may claim to call Enlightenment notions of reason to the interrogation table, it could be argued that these critics learn their methods of interrogation from the very subject they interrogate. To quote the prophet Jeremiah, the sour grapes eaten by our fathers have set the children's teeth on edge. As Thomas Fow has argued, the hermeneutics of suspicion which currently captivates literary studies is arguably simply another stage in an intellectual legacy of an early modern epistemological posture which is axiomatically suspicious, a built-in subject-object posture of scientific detachment which has influenced contemporary inquiry far beyond the domain of the natural sciences. Indeed, the postmodern posture of ferocious, blistering detachment which so troubles Felsky could just as accurately be levied against Francis Bacon when he vowed to put nature on the rack and make it confess its secrets. But while it's easy to be cynical about the motivations of the contemporary humanities departments, anybody that's in a contemporary humanities department knows there's reasons to be <laughs> cynical, um, I think there are also good reasons why scholars have been cautious to offering any positive visions for the future. 
The task of addressing a question as vast and intractable as how we read and why reading matters inevitably calls us beyond the shores of disciplinary concerns and into the murky waters of fundamental philosophical, anthropological, and metaphysical questions. What sort of knowledge does reading offer? What are the epistemological assumptions that are underwriting scholarship? What are the anthropological assumptions baked into our notions of poetic creation, transmission, and reception? If we concede that neither the reader nor the author is a rational, autonomous subject that David Card imagined, then what then is our operative conception of the human person that's underwriting the discipline? And any substantive answers to these questions uh, will invariably have impl implications far beyond the domain of literary studies. And I'm certainly sympathetic with the hesitancy to answer them. While we may intend to address problems of literary studies as some discrete autonomous discipline, we may unknowingly find ourselves tugging at a Jenga piece that holds an essential place within a broader cultural consensus vision of what qualifies as knowledge, love, power, culture, scholarship, personhood, and even reality. And as any Jenga player knows, it's one thing to point at a Jenga piece that needs pulling, and it's quite another thing to be the one who has to pull it. So while it's easy to be suspicious of literary studies in their hesitancy to move beyond conventional orthodoxies, I, I believe this trepidation emerges, at least in part, from a healthy awareness of what's at stake. We can't simply start pulling on Jenga pieces without threatening the integrity of certain cultural consensus, parts of which we may not be ready to part with. As the great classroom of history has taught us, sometimes no teacher is preferable to the wrong teacher. Um, so given these stakes, I'd like to consider what moving on might actually look like in a very brief, exploratory way. Um, do we critically engage literature merely to unmask the illusions of consciousness, or is something else at stake? Can we conceivably move beyond critique without abandoning it altogether? Is it true that if we are not actively, critically disenchanting a text, are we necessarily allowing ourselves to be uncritically enchanted by it, passively accepting unspoken prejudices, norms, and power dynamics which hide beneath the surface? Is the only alternative to a hermeneutics of suspicion an uncritical hermeneutics of faith, a blind or fideistic acceptance of canonical authority? And it's here I believe that Catholic scholars are presented with a rare opportunity to bring the unique depth and wisdom of our tradition to bear on the broader discussion. In particular, I believe we can address these, some of these fundamental questions by returning to Augustine and exploring how some of Augustine's lost conceptual and anthropological insights might not only help us address these questions on a foundational level, but can also help us draw our secular colleagues into a fruitful discussion, addressing contemporary problems in terms that our postmodern colleagues might be able to not only understand, but perhaps even accept. In particular, I want to focus on Augustine's concept of superbia, the inborn spiritual pathology that's often poorly translated as pride. I believe that this anthropological concept, which lies at the heart of Augustine's doctrine of original sin, might not only help literary studies move beyond the conceptual limitations of subjectivity, broadly speaking, but can perhaps aid the field in its search for a post-critical vision of how we read and why reading matters. Sorry, I'm missing a page. Another page for you. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, now, I'm sure that this claim is uh, raising some eyebrows. Um, and um, I admit that the notion that contemporary literary studies might own up to Augustine's twofold darkness of sin and death may seem far fetched. Um, after all, uh, it's difficult to imagine a grand narrative more totalizing, normative, Eurocentric, and subject to the abuse of power than the doctrine of original sin. Uh, and I think that this abuse, this uh, suspicion is warranted given uh, popular conceptions of sin, which tend to conceive of it merely as a list of divinely ordained uh, ethical demands or a legal framework for assessing the metaphysics of personal guilt. Uh, but this superficial understanding of sin doesn't do depth to Augustine's uh, profound conception of the term. Sin for Augustine is not merely a list of moral infractions, but a profound diagnosis of the human psyche one that, I might add, shares certain resonances with the postmodern insights. As previously mentioned, the heart of Augustine's understanding of sin is the notion of pride, superbia. Superbia, as Augustine phrases it, is the first of the vices, the beginning, origin, and cause of all sins. It's the archetypal sin which all other sins emerge as from a root. All sin originates in pride for Augustine. It's so easy to forget this claim. 
On the most basic level, superbia for Augustine simply speaks to the rivalrous self-orientation which is endemic to the human condition. Human beings, according to Augustine, both their conceptions of reality and their inner motivations are not as transparent and objective as they appear. Rather, to be a human, according to Augustine, is to be captivated by profound, self-oriented, self-justifying, and self-deceptive mythologies, which mask over the rivalrous, jealous, resentful ambitions hidden in the depths of the human heart. As John Cavadini describes it, superbia attests to the human propensity to be addicted to illusions. To be human is to be pathologically captivated by obsessive, pre-rational, affective commitments which blind us to realities about ourselves, one another, and the world around us. And on the most basic level of analysis, this diagnosis of the human psyche shares resonances with our postmodern forefathers, the masters of suspicion, Marx, Freud, and Nietzsche. Like, Fro like Freud, Augustine understood all too well that Descartes' rational autonomous subject was an illusion. And like Nietzsche, he knew that we do not know ourselves, we knowledgeable people. We are most ignorant to ourselves. And I believe that recovering Augustine's anthropology of superbia for contemporary literary studies need not require that we reject the hermeneutics of suspicion for some countervailing hermeneutics of faith. And nor does it require that we abandon our critical fac faculties for some uncritical acceptance of textual surfaces. Instead, I believe that recovering superbia in a contemporary context not only expands upon postmodernity's essential insights, but can ha perhaps also help resolve some of its deep incoherences. As John Cavadini continues, Augustine's notion of superbia can perhaps provide us with an even more primal hermeneutics of suspicion, a hermeneutic which, when applied to ourselves and cultural realities, unmasks the deepest sources of our hidden pretensions, inner motivations, and self-deceptions. For while the postmodern critic may challenge the Enlightenment notion of the modern subject in the breach, as many scholars before me have argued, these same critics tend to assume the modern role of the, of the, assume the, role of the modern subject in practice. In contrast, Augustine offers us a more primal hermeneutics of suspicion by challenging the self-transparent subject at its philosophical and existential foundations, incorporating the human propensity for self-justifying self-deception into the very structure and pattern of his thought. In the simplest terms, while post-maternity is sometimes described as a mode of thinking that is suspicious of everything but itself, Augustine turns this on its head and begins his philosophical awakening by applying the hermeneutics of suspicion, first and foremost, not to others, but to himself. Mihi magna questio factus sum, I have become a great question to myself. And from this perspective, I think Catholic scholars are in a unique position to articulate a recovery of superbia, not as a feat of epistemological arrogance, but as a healthy dose of Augustinian humility one that does not require the fideistic adoption of some totalizing metaphysical narrative, as often is portrayed as the metaphysical bogeyman of postmodern nightmares, um, but out simply requires um, a recovery of the essential mysteries and perennial questions. In the simplest terms, I think as we approach texts with critical suspicion, Augustine invites us to simultaneously be suspicious of ourselves, approaching texts with a modest awareness of our own limitations, our own self-justifying narratives, and our hidden motivations. At the very least, the recovery of superbia may help contemporary literary critics reflect on the question of whether their journal article offering a post-colonial deconstruction of Anne of Green Gables is animated by their hopes for international liberation or by their hopes for tenure at Brown. <laughs> um, but, all, but all joking aside, I think that, uh, I think, uh, thanks for laughing. I'm at Cambridge and nobody laughs. I'm like, come on. Throw me a bone. Um, um, and all joking aside, on a most basic level, superbia simply permits us to self-consciously reflect on our pre-absolved commitments and assumptions in our engagement with text. To borrow the language of Vittorio Montemaggi, it allows us to not merely critique a text, but to encounter a text. An encounter, Montemaggi writes, is always personal and particular. It involves our whole selves. By it, we are surprised, challenged, called into question, acknowledged and transformed. But how might you ask, does this vision of reading play out in terms of scholarship? Um, while we all might be familiar with uh, the idea of having the scales lifted our, from our eyes by a work of art, how do we articulate that in terms of data and research, that, that, in, that essential encounter of art that makes us all drawn to it? 
I think Rowan Williams has some insights into the matter about why reading matters to creatures who are captivated by profound self-oriented delusions. In Grace and Necessity, Williams writes that by engaging the will and the intellect in an unforeseen pattern of coherence and integrity, art uncovers relations and resonances in the field of perception that ordinary seeing and experiencing obscure or even deny. In a sense, it could be said that art dispossesses us of our habitual perception and restores to reality a dimension that necessarily escapes our conceptuality and our control. It makes the world strange. And I think that, that this William's language about literature's power to dispossess the readers of their ordinary and habituated ways of seeing the world cuts to the heart of the present question. Most significantly, it offers us a vision of reading that challenges the postmodern dichotomy between reading as uncritical enchantment or critical disenchantment. As the great poet Auden phrased it in an interview with the Daily Telegraph, the poet's vocation is not to enchant the reader, but to disenchant the reader. Poetry should make you see, you see yourself and your world more clearly. The poet may use magic, but for the purpose of disenchanting the reader of their illusions about themselves and the world. And I think that these quotes from Williams and Auden cut to the heart of what is missing and must be recovered by literary studies. As creatures captivated by profound self-oriented illusion, illusions, great works of art have a unique power to dispossess us, to disenchant us, to make the world strange, to expose human beings in our prideful, self-oriented, self-justifying, limited vision of things. But in an even more profound sense, I believe that allowing a work of art to disenchant us of our illusions is the fruit of falling in love with it and falling in love with it precisely for its ability to reach us in a sacred dimension of our personhood that is beyond and beneath our worldly games and captivating illusions of achieving, posturing, and displaying. From this Augustinian perspective, our commitment to close and careful reading is animated first and foremost, not by our pre-absolved commitment to judge, but by the hope of grace. It is a movement from reading as paranoia to reading as metanoia. It is a vision of reading that acknowledges our world needs transforming, but acknowledges that we too must be transformed. And so in closing, I just uh, invite you to reflect on how recovering this simple Augustinian insight might transform the landscape and future of literary studies. What if we engage great works of literature not merely to put them on the rack and make them confess their secrets, but in the hopes that they, by their grace, might lead us to confess our own? So, thank you. Well, we know by now that to be in this panel, you need to have done something extraordinary in your past life. We have the former guitarist of Sons of Bill speaking as a Cambridge scholar and making us laugh and laughing himself. And now, believe it or not, the bar is high. I will call a former surf instructor to the podium. <laughs> you, you may think this is a joke, but you can ask him later. And believe it or not, Patrick will talk to us about the role of artistic and cultural institutions in polarized societies. Uh, thanks for that, Santiago. I, uh, I have taught friends how to surf in uh, Long Beach, Long Island, and in Malibu, California, including actually at least two people in this room here today. Uh, and several of their, one, one of whom has several kids who I gave a group lesson to. That's so. very biblical. You have two witnesses. Good. Exactly. But uh, I fear the opportunities for doing so <clears throat> out this way in one of the Great Lakes are uh, a, little, a little more limited. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be speaking here at Notre Dame. I myself am a graduate uh, of a university with the same name uh, in the Deep South uh, in Australia, where I'm from. Although there we call it the University of Notre Dame, not Notre Dame over here, because uh, we know how to pronounce French words. Um, <laughs> but in many other ways, you know, we're quite a you know forward-looking, progressive nation down there. Uh, we're really we're really ahead of the game. We're about 15 hours specifically ahead of the game uh, time zone compared to you guys. So if you're wondering who's going to win the election next Tuesday, you know, just phone me up Sunday or Monday, and I'll be able to tell you in advance. <laughs> what the outcome is. Uh, it's a great honour to be participating in the, the mothership of all uh, ethics conferences, the fall conference. I've, I've never been myself before, but I've only watched it uh, from afar for many years. 
Uh, I am Australian uh, by birth, but I consider myself an honorary American, having worked about a decade in the States, first in the Archdiocese of New York for several years, heading up Young Adult Outreach, and then uh, in Los Angeles, splitting my time at one point uh, in the communications office for Archbishop Gomez, and then in a very different sort of environment uh, for a foreign affairs sort of center-left progressive think tank of globalists and ex-presidents and prime ministers and all governance folk wanting to change the world for the better. So having worked in quite different ideological climates and environments uh, throughout a fairly tumultuous uh, and continuing so political period, I became um, increasingly concerned about how you hold societies together when so many citizens are in such deep disagreement uh, with one another about fundamental beliefs and values. Now that's obviously a very you know, macro big concern. After a few years, I started to sort of focus that concern, particularly at looking at smaller societies or communities, and that is within corporations and institutions across different sectors, banks, airlines, retail, sports, art and culture, media, themselves which were composed of the same members of society who hold and are committed to lots of different views, but are also committed to the central purpose of the place in which they work. And increasingly, since about the 2010s onwards, lots of companies I found began picking sides or adopting public stances on what I call contested social and political issues. So this could be issues concerning personal identity, gender, sexuality, DEI, race, abortion, marriage, immigration, you name it. Now, most of these issues are not directly related to what those organizations did on a daily basis. And so my concern grew as to what effect that was having on the company amongst its employees, uh, for the company itself and its own standing in society, and how it was actually achieving progress or not on the social or political issue in which that company took a position on. Uh, and so for the last three years, I've been reaching out over email, cold calling essentially, uh, the CEOs, chairs, uh, presidents, university presidents, boards and trustees of uh, most of the major companies and institutions in the US, the UK and the e EU and Australia, uh, wanting to meet with them then one on one to try to understand how they understand the expectation or the pressure for their institution to play a lead role in the various hot button issues of the day, as well as what effects it has on their company and whether due to the backlash that they've received, there may be a better way of running organisations at the governance level, so CEO, board of directors. So since then, I've spoken with about three to 400 business leaders across the political and ideological spectrum, and I've then convened and facilitated roundtable discussions with them uh, under Chatham House rule, where I you know, try to create a sort of safe space uh, for C-suite execs to have good disagreement. That is you know, the kind where you actually listen to someone with a different point of view and then try to constructively engage with them. Now, at the, uh, at the popular or populist level of media and political discourse, this issue tends to be discussed under the banner of woke capitalism. And there are some benefits to that language, um, but there are a lot of limitations. And um, I tend to ca characterize the issue or the challenge really facing those in leadership positions of different institutions, and I'll be focusing my remarks mainly on the cultural and artistic institutions, but the challenge is the same across different sectors as one about how to oversee and steward an incredibly complex institution in a world where everyone inside it seems to hold differing social views on those political topics. And how do you balance that ship without sinking it by getting entangled in a contested issue beyond the capacity of that core business? Uh, but I think it's helpful before I dive into sort of the arts to sort of see that this uh, is a broad challenge, is a general feature of our age, one which is marked by deep polarization and division, with seemingly irreconcilable conflict over values and beliefs, along with decreasing trust and frustration, really, with the traditional arenas of political and democratic activity and progress. And that in these conditions, it's not entirely unsurprising that many look to other institutions, so business, the arts, universities, the courts, media or sport, to make up for or to achieve progress on some of the things which the political process has been ineffective in. Now this goes some way, I think, to explain why since the 2010s and beyond, there's been a notable shift in different institutions' self-understanding. 
but they shouldn't be primarily focused on their core historical good or purpose, but also by other more political or social goals. So for example, example, universities are not primarily for the sake of education and furthering understanding, but also achieving social change or growing the economic pie, or uh, creating the future worker. Media journalism is not primarily for reporting the news as it is and commenting on the issues of the day, but advocacy and shaping society towards a better end. And the business private sector, it's not just about making money by creating valuable products and services and bettering the community which you're in, but by somehow serving all stakeholders uh, and improving the world and so on. Now, on the face of it, it may not seem uh, challenging, and a lot of it depends on the particulars, but this general trend does present its own difficulties and risks, especially the further you get away from the core focus and the good that the institution is primarily built to serve. And the problem I tend to raise with the heads of these different institutions is that when they move their institution to taking a public stance on a contested social and political issue that is not directly related to their core focus, they risk, they seriously risk polarizing their staff along those lines of difference, politicizing their institution because it's unexpected to take stances on other matters, and it ends up polluting public discourse by sort of distorting the incentive structures about how certain social issues are discussed. And I think that happens irrespective of whatever side of the debate they happen to land, although it usually is always just on the progressive side. And I think if they've gotten into the habit of doing that, like I said on previous occasions, then they should expect that there is going to be an ongoing expectation that they speak out similarly on lots of other issues and that they'll likely also experience tension, ongoing tension within their organisation around those sorts of matters. So this grounds my advice and recommendation to them that institutions should exercise the virtues of corporate restraint when it comes to expressing views on such matters, either explicitly in public statements or implicitly by engaging in certain operational activities and training out of respect for the diversity of views that exists within their own organisation and beyond it. Now, universities have obviously been dealt this reality uh, most harshly recently over here and as well as in my country. And that's partially, I think, going to explain why many of them have begun to follow Harvard's example, which itself is a variation on an earlier position advocated for by the University of Chicago and its Calvin report back in 1967 basically where it recommended that the university should restrain from offering a university level view on external matters so as to foster academic debate uh, and freedom. Now I've been workshopping this approach with leaders in other sectors including uh, a fair number of those heading up the artistic and cultural institutions in New York, uh, Washington DC and LA by spurring the collective imagination and creativity already present amongst uh, these individuals to conceive what the feasibility and benefits might be of a similar approach that could help their institutions. Now these folks' jobs, these are folks like direct directors of museums, artistic directors within operas, ballet companies, chairs of trustees of 150 person sort of boards. Uh, they are not easy jobs today anymore. Gone uh, the days where all you sort of needed was, uh, you know, the institution needed was someone with a PhD in art history or music and then a knack at finding a good curator or a good performer. Essentially, these days, they're required to be high-stakes, culturally sensitive diplomats, able to be communicating effectively with artists, donors, trustees, and activists, as well as also being expert fundraisers and commercially savvy operators. And institutionally, as I mentioned as well before, the expectations surrounding museums, for example, has also been changing over the last few decades, from a time when the focus was mostly on collecting and preserving and presenting to gradually being expected to be community facing, inclusive, reaching diverse audiences, engaged in the issues of the day, reckoning with cultural and colonial histories and reappraising the cultural canon. So it's all very uh, quite fraught now. <clears throat> now the challenges these leaders face and, and the merits of the approach that I outlined earlier, I think can be considered in light of a few recent high profile controversies that broke out in the performing arts and visual arts and museum landscape in your country uh, and in mine since the conflict in the Middle East began. So first a couple of cases in the visual arts sector, the museum sector in New York where I've just come from. 
So some of you may have visited the Noguchi Museum, which is in Long Island City in Queens. Uh, it's a, an intimate meditative museum with a sculpture garden. It's built by the category-defying sculptor Isamu Noguchi. Now, it updated its dress code recently, prohibiting employees from wearing political messages, slogans, and symbols. Now, it was reintroduced after several employees had been wearing the kefir for months. Uh, three employees continued to wear it after the new policy came into effect, and after several warnings, they were subsequently fired. So around two months ago, 60 uh, people, including two-thirds of the museum's own current workforce, as well as former staff and outside supporters, protested outside the museum. The museum released a statement soon after things blew up, expressing sympathy with critics, but defending its decision, stating that some forms of expression can unintentionally alienate segments of diverse visitorship. It can be seen as political, and that the museum has a responsibility to foster an inclusive environment. Now, this brought about a few predictable responses at the time. One that wearing, uh, that was not a political, but it's a humanitarian statement, and that banning it was a political statement. Uh, and the others that such a code went against Noguchi's and the museum's values. Uh, and pressure is now being placed on its funding sources, including the Mayor Adams, Bloomberg Philanthropies, and Mitsubishi. The second one is the Brooklyn Museum, which is the second largest museum in New York, which is currently celebrating its uh, bicentennial celebration since its founding. Now, it is a avowedly uh, and, and sort of self-described progressive institution, both artistically and administratively. You can go back all the way to its sort of 1999 uh, uh, debate with Mayor Giuliani and Catholics over a very controversial artwork on the Virgin Mary, through its, through its sort of more recent hashtag Me Too exhibit, problematic exhibit a few weeks ago. Uh, it also has an unceded land acknowledgement on the facade of its works and tries to incorporate anti-racist and anti-oppressive practices in all facets of its museum life. Um, but none of that has stopped it from being a hotbed of activism for the last few months with the, the homes of both the director, Anne Pasternak, and the chair, Barbara Vogelstein, um, their homes being sort of spray painted with red paint uh, from this. And this is a museum which you know, has been facing budget cuts and lumbering along with an endowment of sort of smaller than Harvard's by a factor of, you know, sort of by a factor of 407. Who only knows how much smaller would be compared to Notre Dame's endowment. But, uh, uh, and then in uh, Sydney, more recently in the performing arts, we had two companies, the Sydney Theatre Company and the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, uh, which both had similar uh, instances recently, which have led to board members leaving, budgets being cut, um, and significant cutback, really, on the performance of the institution. In all of these examples, the challenge is how do you build, sorry, how do you balance artistic expression and creativity with the many and varied views held across a community, including its audiences, funders, and backers? And that short of getting any answer on that, it's only just a matter of time before another institution ends up on the front page of the New York Times. Now, I think a balance, as I said, needs to be struck. While we can all respect artistic freedom, I think it's reasonable and appropriate that that respect presumes certain expectations, boundaries, and responsibilities. And that's particularly the case where the expression of personal views on a contested issue risks distracting or detracting from the art itself or damaging and discrediting the company that presents it. Now, some people often say here, well, art is you know, inherently political. It's inevitably disruptive. And I think they would be right. There are some forms of artistic expression which are more designed for the exploration of personal, social, and political views than others. Festivals, special galas, dedicated events, as opposed to sort of standard performance settings, performances of Stamped Repertory or guest soloists in the classics. Of course, the latter may also deal with political themes, but this is typically inherent in the performance itself. So my uh, question to those looking to advocate and use the platform of the stage in such settings is, is this really the right time, manner, and place for expressing personal views on contested issues? Uh, nonetheless, it's a bit of a, a gray area, and until recently, most performing arts companies and museums in Australia and the US have taken a generally permissive view or encouraging approach to artists speaking out in both their creative work and commentary alongside it on a wide range of matters and mostly advancing a progressive worldview. But as the recent conflict in the Middle East exposed new fault lines and fractured progressive sentiment, particularly between generations, I guess the question is whether this laissez-faire approach is and should now be reconsidered. Is it really fit for purpose in polarized times? 
So I'll just finish with saying, with one of the leading artistic and cultural institutions in the US, the Getty Trust and Museum in Los Angeles, committing itself recently and then also encouraging others in the same sector to freedom of expression that doesn't shy away from a diversity of views. There's clearly much that can be built upon. And I think there's also massive goodwill amongst the creative community, both here in the US uh, and in Australia. And so I don't think division and difference need be a threat. It's also an opportunity for creativity, for exploring subtleties, building bridges and alerting audiences to new possibilities. And I think if any sector can do this well, it's the arts, because it's for art is uniquely positioned to sort of model a form of cultural expression that can mend rather than exacerbating divides. And I think if any imagination can do that well, it's the Catholic imagination, because it uniquely sees the intrinsic beauty of the arts and the appeal it has to every human person. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, for a wonderful presentation. I know what you're thinking now. How will I manage to offer you yet another presenter with an extraordinary past life? But this is what you learn after 13 consecutive years of moderating at the Fall con Conference. <laughs> I will give you now a person whose book has been read by Ethan Hawke. And the book is not called How to Fall Apart with a Hollywood Star, but it's on Flannery O'Connor. Furthermore, our next speaker invited Bruce Springsteen to his ordination. And when he was in first chair of the seminary, he wrote to Uma Thurman. Neither Bruce turned up in the ordination nor did Uma answer, thank God, maybe he wouldn't be a priest today. <laughs> <clears throat> so now Father Damien is going to talk to us, not about those more interesting things that he can talk about in, in the hall, but about handling serpents. Perhaps you need to know how to handle serpents. And drinking poison, effectively engaging secular culture as a Catholic. Father Damien. Thank you, thank you. Thank you In my suit coat. At the end of Mark's gospel, Jesus upbraids the eleven for their unbelief and hardness of heart before telling them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Jesus informs his apostles that those who believe will be baptized and will be saved, and those who do not believe will be condemned. Then he tells them that certain signs will accompany those who believe. They will pick up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. There are certainly a variety of ways to understand this passage, but in this paper, I would like to interpret the serpents and the deadly drink as the secular culture in which we live, and I would like to show how Mark's gospel offers us the way of effectively engaging secular culture as Catholics for the sake of transforming said culture without being harmed by it. In the Aristotelian Thomistic tradition, virtue is defined by excess and deficiency, too much or too little of something. When it comes to approaching the secular culture as a Catholic, it is common to either fall headlong into the sec sec secular culture and be corrupted by it, or to take on a fortress mentality and to avoid secular culture altogether, which is the antithesis of church being present and operative in those places and circumstances where she can become the salt of the earth, as the Second Vatican Council teaches us. The first extreme is certainly worse, but both work against the Great Commission. My hope for this paper is to present a clear path forward for those who desire to engage the secular culture without being harmed by it. At the very least, such an approach will help create a culture of encounter but the ultimate goal is to transform, heal, and redeem a culture with the light of the gospel. This paper has three major parts. First, I want to begin with an overview of Mark's gospel, paying special attention to the way in which Jesus forms his 12 apostles and then sends them out on mission. Second, I want to show that the only way not to be harmed 
by handling serpents and drinking poison is by maintaining a deep and consistent prayer life, life of the sacraments, and life of community. And third, I want to offer some helpful examples of engaging the secular culture as a Catholic from my own experience as an evangelist. So first, Mark's gospel as training in missionary discipleship. Mark's gospel begins not with a genealogy or infancy narrative or a prologue, but with the simple statement, quote, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, unquote. And the next 16 chapters follow that matter-of-fact style of presenting the good news of Jesus Christ to the reader without all the interesting details offered in the accounts of Matthew and Luke. For those of you who are Catholic or are part of a church that uses a lectionary cycle, we are currently in year B, which means that we have been hearing from the Gospel of Mark all year on most Sunday liturgies. The first chapter of Mark's Gospel is a flurry of activity. John the Baptist fulfills the prophet Isaiah and prepares the way of the Lord and then baptizes Jesus in the River Jordan where the Spirit descends upon him and we hear first of his beloved sonship. Next, He's driven out, driven out in the desert for 40 days, and before you know it, John is arrested, and Jesus says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And all this happens in the first 15 verses. Next, he calls Simon and Andrew, James and John, and immediately they leave their nets and follow him. Then Jesus gets to work. First, he drives an unclean spirit out of a man while teaching in the synagogue. Next, he heals Simon's mother-in-law, who lay sick with a fever. That evening, he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out demons. The next morning, he prayed in solitude, and then moved throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues, casting out demons. Chapter 1 of Mark's Gospel then concludes with Jesus healing a leper. You tired yet? In chapter 2, we are presented with more healing, this time of a paralytic whose friends tear off the roof to get him close to Jesus. And then we hear that, quote, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came to call the righteous, not the righteous, not the righteous, but sinners. More healings and standing down unclean spirits occur in chapter 3 until Jesus appoints the 12 apostles, all of whom, by the way, are sinners whom he desires to make righteous. So I want to pause here, because these 12 sinners that Jesus calls to himself will become saints in the foundation of his apostolic church, which means that they are us. So we need to pay close attention to the way in which Jesus forms the 12, because how he forms the 12 is how he forms us, the members of his body, the church of which he is the head. For the remainder of chapter 4, he preaches parables to large crowds, but only explains his parables to the 12. He offers them images of a lamp and a mustard seed, and then shows his power by calming the sea, and they are filled with awe in his presence. Now, I promise you, I will not summarize each chapter of Mark's gospel this afternoon, but I do beg of you to allow me a few words about chapter 5, verse 1 through 20. This is Jesus' first time in Mark's gospel where he enters pagan territory in the land of the Gerasenes. To me, this is the most Flannery O'Connor-esque story in the New Testament, as it's the only one, or as it's the one where Jesus meets a man possessed by demons in the cemetery and proceeds to send those demons into a herd of 2,000 swine as they jump off a cliff and die. It's also the gospel I request, I have requested to have read at my funeral mass. <laughs> Amen. And outside someone's funeral mass, it's only read once a year on the Monday of the fourth week of ordinary time at a liturgy. It's true. Here's why I love the story so much. I read it as a microcosm of the entire gospel. Jesus, who is God-made man, enters into the land of darkness and death, and he does so without fear. The man who is possessed by legion, by the way, does anyone remember what his name is? He doesn't have one because he's you, he's me. So the man who is possessed by legion stands for the whole human race, and he's the one Jesus comes to redeem. Jesus drives out the demons and heals the man and puts him in his right mind, and then he sends this restored man back to his family and friends to tell them about what the Lord and his mercy has done. In other words... 
The man becomes an evangelizer. He's sent out to tell the good news. He does what has been done for him. And the apostles witness the whole thing firsthand. They are learning on the job who Jesus is, the kind of power he has, and that he is not afraid of anything. A few verses later, he even brings a dead girl back to life. After five chapters of Jesus' teaching, driving out demons and healing people, he calls the twelve, and then he sends them out to preach repentance, cast out many demons, and anoint with oil the sick and heal them. They have been apprenticing him long enough that he entrusts them to his ministry, and they do it. The apostles returned to Jesus, and they told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a lonely place. Rest a while. They are learning on the job from the master and doing well. But in this chapter, but in chapter 9, they encounter a dumb spirit that is too much for them, but not for their master. When they inquire about it, Jesus explains to them that some demons can only be driven out through prayer and fasting. Shortly before the Last Supper, Jesus directs the attention of his disciples to a poor widow who offers a preview of what is to come. He notes, she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, her whole living being. In chapter 14, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it, gave it to them and said, take this, take, this is my body, and he took a cup. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And the next day, he literally pours out his body and blood on the cross at Golgotha, taking on death itself. And he wins. Death has lost its sting. Three days later, he has risen. Interestingly, Jesus doesn't appear to the 12 minus Judas first. He appears to Mary Magdalene and then to the couple on the road and then to the 11. And when he does, he upbraids them for their lack of belief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him as he had first risen. And then he sends them out. And just as death hasn't harmed Jesus, nor will serpents or poison harm his apostles. I offer this summary of Mark's gospel to give us the context for the line about handling serpents and drinking poison. In Mark's gospel, Jesus fears nothing and heals the sick, cures the leper, feeds the hungry, drives out demons, brings the dead back to life, and then he conquers death itself. Then in his resurrection, he entrusts that same power to his apostles. And they went forth and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by signs that attended it. Part two. Sustaining life in Jesus and his church. As members of one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the words spoken by Jesus to the apostles at the end of Mark's gospel are spoken to us as well, to all the baptized, not just clergy and religious. The Second Vatican Council reminds us, the lay apostolate, however, is a participation in the saving mission of the church itself. Through their baptism and confirmation, all are commissioned to that apostolate by the Lord himself. Even more evidence is offered in the dismissal spoken at the end of every Mass. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life, or go and announce the gospel of the Lord. It can be scary, however, to go out as a missionary disciple, as we may think, I don't know enough, or I'm not strong enough, or I don't know what I'm doing. Join the club. Jesus does not call the qualified, but qualifies those he has called. The truth is that none of us are worthy, but... If we are tethered to him and his church, it will be enough. I want to offer three conditions for being able to handle serpents and drinking deadly things. That is, three conditions to engage secular culture without being harmed by it. They are personal life of prayer, the sacramental life, and a communal life of faith. Prayer life. In Mark's gospel, we are told that Jesus, in the morning, a great while before day, rose and went out to a lonely place, and there he prayed. And he makes sure that his apostles follow his example. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest a while. My bishop is about to publish his first pastoral letter. One of the highlights of the letter to all the faithful of the Diocese of Cleveland is a challenge to set aside 15 minutes every day for prayer and to go away to a lonely place without a phone, without earbuds, without any screens, and pray. It's a simple request of my bishop and easier said than done. A personal prayer life is essential to the life of a missionary disciple. Making time every day to go to that lonely place, whether it's in a church or a chapel, designated space in my home or on campus, where God can speak to our hearts and our hearts can speak to God's heart is what makes a disciple a disciple. At the end of the day, we are made for friendship with God. And just as we need to make time to be 
with our friends, so too do we need to be deliberate in making time every day without distraction for God. If we are not, not making time for conversation with Jesus daily, if we are not nurturing that friendship with the one who heals and drives out demons, if we are not resting daily in that lonely place of prayer, those serpents and poison will kill us. <clears throat> Sacramental life. The Second Vatican Council reminds us that Christ is always present in his church, especially in her liturgical celebrations. He is present at the sacrifice of the Mass under Eucharistic species, sacraments, his word, and when the church prays and sings. Moreover, the Council teaches every liturgical celebration because it is an action of Christ the priest and of his body the church is a sacred action surpassing all others. In other words, the life of discipleship flows out of the liturgy and back into it and as we've already covered at the dismissal at the rites of Mass. Pope Francis, perhaps more than any other modern pope, has stressed the importance of frequent celebration of the sacrament of reconciliation to encounter God's healing mercy. He has also referred to the Mass as the reception and the reception of frequent communion, in particular as a way of encountering God's love and mercy. Of course, John Paul II and Benedict XVI stood on the same ground. I mention all this because... Once someone has been faithfully initiated into the life of the church through baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist, the way to maintain and deepen one's identity in Christ is through encountering him repeatedly at Mass and regular confession. Does one have to go to Mass every day to be able to handle serpents and drink poison and not be harmed? Maybe not, but it doesn't hurt. And I would recommend that if you know you are about to encounter snakes and poison, go to Mass. More on this in the next section. Third, communal life. As a church, we are part of one body made up of many parts. We are part of a church that is suffering, militant, and triumphant. We are a community of believers, and there is a reason we gather together, because where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. The Christian life is impossible to live alone. We need friends. We need people to walk with us and cry with us and talk with us and pray with us and go out to the world with us. Again, I refer to my bishop's new pastoral letter that will be published next month. In it, he asks that every Catholic in the diocese be part of some small group where the faith can be shared, where stories can be told, where support may be given and received. We live in a world where people are reporting alarming rates of loneliness, not just the elderly, but especially the young. As Drew Holcomb sings, you got to find your people. Does anyone know that song? Okay. <laughs> you will be able to handle serpents, and you won't be able to handle serpents and drink poison without them. Finally, examples. In this final section of the paper, I want to briefly offer a few examples that I've seen of handling serpents and drinking poison without being harmed for consideration. First, in film. Although Bishop Robert Barron is known as America's teaching bishop with the empire that is word on fire, I still claim that some of his most important work in evangelization has been his commentary on film. Back when he was still a priest and seminary professor, he would make short YouTube videos on rated R films like The Departed, Fargo, and Gran Torino. People screen one of those films and then search for a commentary, meet a smart priest who helps them think about what they saw and are grateful for his contribution and intrigued by his way of life. Theater. Back in 2007, I saw Spring Awakening on Broadway. I knew nothing about the show, bought cheap tickets at TKTS the day of, and Jonathan Groff and Leah Michelle were new to me. If you are familiar with the musical, you'll know that it's a coming-of-age show, and the music, is, uh, the music is fun and catchy, but morally speaking, there are a lot of problems for the Catholic. However, one observation I made about the show is that none of the adults in the show know anything, and therefore, the young people are left to fend for themselves. When I share this insight with fans of the show, I have yet to meet one who recognized this lack of guides or mentors in the musical and agree that young people need some wisdom figures to mature well. Fiction. As you heard in my intro, I am a Flannery O'Connor guy. I can't begin to tell you how knowing Flannery O'Connor's fiction has opened doors for me with conversations with atheists, agnostics, lapsed Catholics, and the like, whether it be a conference online in a coffee shop, at a concert, or in an airport. Knowing Flannery also makes people recommend their favorite fiction to me, which I am able to read and then engage in conversation. What do I have, two minutes? One. One, okay, finally, popular music. Chapel Roan. Anyone know her? H-O-T-T-O-G-O, -O. okay. So I went to her show in Cleveland. I reviewed her, um, I, I wrote a little article for America Magazine. A, a disenfranchised woman on the peripheries who's a, a senior in high school in Cleveland wrote me a letter about it. I'll just, um, 
I, I brought the letter here. I'll just read you two sentences. I braced myself before I read it, meaning your article, thinking about all the targeted opinions you might have about her, but I underestimated you. I didn't think a priest could write about someone like her, who was, as the Catholic Church would say, deserves to go to hell by how she lives in such a beautiful way. I didn't believe that anyone of the Catholic faith would understand why it's okay to listen to someone like her. I want to thank you for your impact on my perspective. You made it easier for me to see God in a beautiful way. I'm forever grateful to that. I wish you all the best, and I will be praying for you. Thank you. Thank you, Father Damien. What a wonderful panel we had. We have now a few minutes for any questions unrelated to the past lives of these <laughs> gentlemen. Although, although, if there is time, you may want to ask them or ask one of them to sing a song for us. I mean, Father Damien, of course, just kidding, James. Uh, for, <laughs> for the questions, I will ask you to kindly introduce yourselves, if you will, and to be concise, even if you don't will. And to the speakers, if you can also be concise in your answers, because I think we will have a few questions. Please. Yeah. Michael Sullivan from Chicago, the Sanctuary Academy. Uh, this is directed primarily to you, Father Damien, but you know, to your, your own responses. Um, um, they told me I have to talk in this when I talk, so I have it yeah, ready. Sure. It seems that what, when you're talking about Mark's gospel, Jesus was on offense. He was going against a kingdom of darkness, and he was liberating the people that were in it, and he was using supernatural means. How can we recover that sense of, uh, within our Catholic culture, of being able to do that? Because, in a sense, secular culture really doesn't have very much to offer. You know, but oftentimes, I think that when we encounter secular culture, we feel sort of timid, kind of timidity. Or timidity. Whereas, uh, what we see in that gospel is you know, laying hands on the, on the sick, and they get better, and, and a kind of um, robust um, confidence. Thank you for your question. I was in a conversation about this yesterday. I have a new job as of three years ago. I'm the vicar for evangelization in the Diocese of Cleveland. So the bishop has four vicars. He has this vicar general, um, judicial vicar, the vicar for clergy, and um, vicar for evangelization. When people ask me what I do, I said, well, these other three vicars, their job is to put out fires. Mine is to set them. And it's playing offense. But I think as a church, especially in terms of downtown and institution, we've gotten so, we've actually gotten pretty good at playing defense and making sure that we have statements when something bad happens and we're able to respond quickly with a press release. But when it comes to actually telling the good news and going out and setting fires and being alive with the gospel that Jesus has risen, I don't know if we know how to do that very well. So I think we have a lot of work to do. But yeah, following. Jesus' example, and then the example of the apostles in Mark's gospel is a good place to start. Thank you. Yes, please. Pardon? Do they need a microphone to ask their question? No, no need. We're good. You can ask your question. You don't need a microphone. Just speak loud. Okay, I'll I'll speak. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry. So the questions to James. Thank you very much for your paper. So you mentioned Paul Ricoeur at the beginning, just because he coined the term hermeneutics of suspicion. And um, so he strikes me as one of the best philosophers in having like proposed an alternative to, like a very smart alternative to hermeneutics of suspicion. He wasn't Catholic, however, he was Protestant. So my, you know, my question would be, you know, do you have any thoughts about him? And also, what do you think is, is uh, you know, Catholicism can add? Specifically, can add that like way out post Gosh, it's a good it's a good question, Geronimo. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a it's a good question and a uh, and a big one. No, and and the the whole hermeneutic tradition, you know, that 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 uh, you know from from truth and method through Ricoeur, um has so much in it that's great and worthy of reflection and looking at. I. I Again, I, I feel like so much 20th, 20th century philosophical discourse is forcing us to adopt new language, new terms um, that sometimes obscure the power of our old ones. Um, which, uh, which, so that's why I, you know, we can thank Heidegger for that, perpetuating the PhD industry ad infinitum with new terms that we have to figure out what they mean. Um, so that's why I think, um, I think going back to 
the the fathers. I think the best, you know, the best uh, promise um, for, you know, best way Catholicism can address it is just leaning into the Catholicity of the vision and the Catholicity of the Christian faith. And by going back to a figure like Augustine, who is someone who um, everybody can somehow relate to and understand these core things, that we're not approaching it from a combative perspective, but drawing people in, you know, that as Catholics, there's no truth that we have to be afraid of. All truth is God's truth. So that's an advantage over um, a world that has lots of uh, commitments that they're unwilling to, to, to question for often reasons that lurk beneath the surface of our understanding. Is that, is that, is that helpful? I know that's really, I know that's really, really broad, uh, but, but that's, that's, that's what I would say. Great. So I have right now one, two, three questions. I will please ask you to ask the questions first, the three questions, and then we'll have the answers to them, starting with you. Yes, please. Yes. Thank you. You. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Sorry. 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 It's the second time it happens. James Matthew Wilson, I'm a frequent listener to the Sons of Bill. Um, <laughs> my question was inspired by Patrick's presentation, but I think actually all three of you might have something to say on it. And that's, you, you ended with stating something that I think is genuinely true, that, um, that, uh, that it's, it's more or less an article of faith that we are obliged to, as Catholics to believe in the integrity of being as created by God, and, and, and therefore we have an obligation to an openness to truth, to goodness, and also to the, that sort of strangely disinterested kind of erotic love that is for beauty. And yet, uh, when I think of taking that to into the world of woke capitalism, I could I could imagine being greeted by two different responses. First one is like President Budweiser's too busy counting dollars to hear what you're saying, but his advertising staff they're not they're not just neutral secular people. Chances are they have a kind of gnostic vision of being itself as a kind of curse to be overcome by the power of the will, and so. I'm just wondering whether the chops of just advocating for some kind of institutional neutrality is really the answer to the present gross state of our culture. Thank you. We'll have the next question, then the third, and then the answers. Please. Sure. I'm Zena Gomez-Liss. I'm a uh, student, actually of James's, uh, at the University of St. Thomas. And my uh, question is for Patrick. Um, specifically about, you mentioned 2010 around that, that time. That was when the iPhones first came about. The challenges of technology advancing faster than we can adapt as human beings to if, uh, how we talk to each other. And so oftentimes these uh, social issues like spiral out of control become viral and then uh, become like fires. Like so. What um, what challenges do you see right now with uh, the way that technology advances to uh, compassionately engaging these difficult subjects? And is there a way to use that in a positive way uh, as Catholics? Thank you. And um, your question, sir? I'm Joshua Schultz of uh, Philosophy at the Sales University. Uh, my question kind of dovetails with these. Is, you know, given that there's a kind of puritanism that comes along with polarization, uh, where we have to defend uh, kind of absolutism with our views. What sorts of pitches are you making at, at this governance level that you find effective? Is it the loss of income? Is it return to core mission? Is it uh, values alignment? Can we talk about, uh, for example, welcoming a diversity of views? I'm kind of curious what is resonating with uh, us folks. Lovely. I guess you have some questions. <laughs> and maybe we'll have time for one or more, too, perhaps. Yeah, thanks for collectively pooling all of those uh, together at the same time for me. Uh, I'll take a quick stab at all uh, three of them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you, you'll get pushback on the idea of neutrality from either ends of the spectrum. Uh, folks on the, on the left, I know these terms left and right aren't sort of always perfectly helpful, but you get pushed back from the left from saying organizations, if you're neutral, you're sort of, you're, you're being silent in the face of you know, the, the pressing issues of the day. Uh, and, uh, and, and the right, 
or what you were sort of pitching, I'm not saying it was a conservative thing, it was more essentially that we should be articulating a more a more positive vision of what an institution is, is about. Um, that's where I'd like to be uh, and that's where I think it needs to go. I see this step as a sort of middle step area that it, it's, it basically just recognises that within any organisation or society you have people who hold very different views and try to create some zone of um, uh, almost a sort of a Rawlsian place uh, of uh, where we can be somewhat ignorant with what each of us thinks with regards to highly contested matters that don't directly relate to what we're doing on a daily basis. But if you're creating conditions for respect for those views that people hold within a company, that that's a better place than trying to push an institution to express a view on a contested matter of which people inside it may hold different views. So um, I tend to not use the word neutrality because neutrality sounds like waving a white flag. That's why I sort of use the language of restraint, which I think has more sort of a virtuous notion uh, packaged into it. Um, on the second question on technology and social media, uh, that's undoubtedly a huge factor in the decay in general in public discourse and argumentation. Um, it's, uh, you know, John Haidt has, has written quite a few quite well about this and is leading a very effective campaign against the social media companies at the moment. But there's no doubt that that has deteriorated our ability to talk with people who hold different points of views um, and the different media platforms are all um, in their own ways vulnerable to, to corrupting uh, that. How to use it in in a positive way? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, that's a that's a very good question. I'd be trying to find any forms of technology and, and, and media that actually enable you to uh, listen to a broad range of views, both in terms of the news that you consume. I think if there's ways to diversify our con con news consumption, that would be a, a great thing. Um, and just have exposure to, to, to the best arguments that have been thought and said on competing sides of issues. And I'm trained in philosophy and I'd like to think if I'm going to study abortion or any other sort of controversial issue, I want to read the best that's been said uh, for it and against it and then make up my mind through it. And so if there was a social media platform that could give you the best argument opposed to your view, I think you'd be enriched if you're able to um, come across that. You'd learn and, and develop your own views from that. Uh, in terms of the sort of most effective uh, pitch or angle, uh, I think um, I think what I've found has been helpful is the recognition that if you ask someone how they would feel if they were in a company where their boss took uh, the company and a view opposed to what they hold, how you would feel working in that company, how you'd feel expressing your view with someone, uh, with a peer, uh, with your supervisor, direct report. I think most people instinctively just feel immediately like, oh, I feel uncomfortable working in this sort of place. I don't know, I wouldn't really want to share my point of view. Uh, and if you can get most people to, to recognise that, then you can sort of say, well, what are the conditions from which whoever's in the, the top position or whoever's in the bottom position, we can all feel that we're, we can thrive here in a company and work effectively with people across different lines. So I think the polarisation dynamic is, is, a, is a relatively new one that has not been top of mind to a lot of corporate leaders. They tend to they tend to act in concert uh, as a pack um, in terms of what are the other my peer companies doing in the sector, what's the meet the likely media reaction, uh, what's the sort of the mood and zeitgeist. Uh, and so uh, that's generally been uh, the, 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 the sort of the governance thinking. Uh, however, the backlash has obviously been extremely effective in, in making them realise that that can come with significant costs. So there's a a reshift going on in the states towards, I think, generally a more balanced view on this. Uh, Australia's a bit further behind, even though we're so far ahead time-wise. We're a little bit behind culturally uh, and governance-wise, uh, but hopefully we can catch up to where things are here. Well, I I leave you with this fantastic panel we had and with some information uh, about the past lives of our speakers who perhaps <laughs> We'll be willing to talk about that as well over coffee and so on. And if you get him to sing the Sons of Bill song, let us know so that we all come. Thank you very much and continue to enjoy.